I was just gonna ask, like, all right, so you guys were together basically for 10 years. Mm. How soon in before you farted in front of her? <laughs> Three? Three? Three years? years? Yeah, I, I was date one. <laughs> yeah, I can like, see like, that. Yeah, because you, like, you know, like, listen, you want to throw, I, I so want you. To, that's one of your here's what you're bombs. in for. I just want yeah. you to understand. Yeah. I, I want you to understand what you're in for. <laughs> Fantasy Football Happy Hour with Matthew Berry, served by Applebee's. That's right. By the way, uh, here with Jay Croucher, head trader of Points Bet, and I want everyone to know at home that on our first meeting, when we had our first audition show together, I also let one rip. You let did. you know what you were in for. It was magnificent. It was early. And you're still here. I'm still here. But you know, I like to set expectations low <laughs> from the get-go. Like yeah. this is the di- this is what you're signing up for. 100%. You know, you actually kind of screwed me a little bit because you asked me. Just a little me, bit? Yeah, you asked me in that segment, how long have you been married to your wife, Jay? And I said five years because I thought it was five years. It turns out it's actually three years and she was watching the show. And I think if I'd said four or six and been off by one, it would have been fine. Right. But the fact that I was two years off and how long we've been married, Kind of created some drama in the Did Crowther household. A little bit. Yeah. She, she was upset. <laughs> yeah, wasn't great. She was upset that she, because it made you seem like longer, that it hasn't been blissful. Is that yeah. the inference? Yeah, exactly. I mean, the thing, like, we have a daughter who's almost five, and so I was kind of like, because at that point, you kind of, I was all in. Yeah, so, at that point, right, yeah. right. Which exactly. is how I explained it to her, but still not great. Still not great? Yeah. What's your wife's name? Sophia. Sophia? Yeah. Listen, Sophia, I want you to take a, let's go to camera run real quick. Let me, I'm going to address your wife, Sophia, here. <laughs> Sophia, take a good look at me. I want you to take a good look at me. Okay, now do me a favor. Right, let's go to camera two and get Jay. Okay, great, right, there you go. All right, now wide shot here, camera three. Get the both of us. Look, before you complain too much about Jay, this is what else is out there. This is what you're dealing with. I think when Jay good. gets home tonight, I think you say, you know what, honey? Thank God for you. I love you. I just, I saw what the other options are. Hmm. Yeah, so, you know what, what, scroll through Twinder for, uh, t- t- uh, Twinder, whatever, Tinder, whatever it is. <laughs> I, I, I've been Three a thousand times. years since I've been in one of those things. Yeah, uh, hmm. but, yeah, scroll through Tinder. You know what, Sophia, go out on one date with just anyone, and you'll see, you'll be kissing his butt. I'm just telling you right now, because this is what else is out there. Look at this. A good little bit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm just saying. There you go. I appreciate that. All Matthew. right. Yeah, I got your back. Yeah. Sophia, whatever. Um, at least you admit you were you were married. Yeah. He's on national TV. He could have been yeah. no, ladies. I'm out there. No, no, no. You were yeah. like you know 100. percent Yeah. There you go. All right. Um, so that's where we are with. Uh, all right. So you and Sophia. Hopefully that'll get all figured out. In the meantime, uh, I, so I don't know what odds I would put on you and your wife surviving another year of marriage. But what I do know is that you've got your best bets here. We've got, yeah. so the first segment here is we're going to get into your best bets on the Fantasy Football Happy Hour served by Applebee's. Yes. We're thrilled. It's day two. Applebee's has not bailed on the show. We thought they might. I would if I was them, but for whatever reason, they are hanging tough. But you know what? That's the same thing. That's what we did in one show one. Mm. Like we just, we let it all hang out. Yes. I made, I made. You know he's signing up I made, for. I made two different Zach Wilson jokes. Yes. You know, and so just a Applebee's. This is what you signed up for. Just let them know right at the get go. Exactly. And so then it's just, you know, a hey. Chicken finger chat. 100%. They got it. All right. These are your best bets. And before we get into what your best bets are for the season, mm. now that the preseason is done, yep. you know, so the teams are sort of settled at this point. Talk, take us through your process and, and what these best bets are. These are not the ones that you think are most likely to happen. No, no. So what I'm looking at is what I see as the value relative to the odds. It's the same thing with value relative to average draft position. It's just that I'm dealing with odds. So look, we're going to talk about a bet, the, the second bet, which is plus 3,000. Plus right. 3,000 means that the implied probability is 3%. So if you think it's a 4% chance to happen, Rashawn Gary, Defensive Player of the Year, spoiler alert, then it's a good bet. If you think it's a 10% chance to happen, then it's a phenomenal bet. So we're just taking, we're taking value relative to the odds. Right, exactly. You are just, this isn't, this isn't about what you is most likely to happen. It is what the most value is to, to your point, which is we're just playing odds. Yes. We're just playing because, odds. Look, the, the safest bet for, for some of these, look, the safest Super Bowl bet, I'm going to make a Super Bowl bet at the end of the segment, but the safest one is, is taking the Bills to play the Bucs because they're the two favorites, they're the two best teams, but relative to the odds, they might not be the best bet. So I'll exactly. be choosing a different so, team. So we get to your first bet um, in terms of, so 
at the moment, uh, let's go. We're going to go to the AFC South. Yeah. Right. So you great have a, division. Great division. Exactly. So like the favorites to win that division are the Colts. Yeah. But they're at minus one thirty-five. Exactly. So obviously, whatever. You bet a hundred bucks. You know, you're not winning a hundred bucks. Yeah. You know. So the the idea here is okay. How can we make the most money? Okay. So uh, Colts are at minus one thirty-five. But there's the Texans at plus 3,300. I don't think you're going Texans. Where are you going here, Jay? So I'm going with the Jags. What a great way to start, right? Sure, with the exactly. Jacksonville Jags, the team synonymous with victory and winning, yeah, exactly. catching bets. But this isn't so much a bet on the Jags as much as it's a bet against the Colts and the Titans. Fair. I think this is the worst division in football. And when you're dealing with a bad division, there's opportunity for value on the long shots. Now, I look, I know the Titans were a one seed last year. That was very fluky. They went six and two in one score game. Games. Looking at our internal numbers, looking at PFF, DVOA, none of those systems had the Jazz, had the Titans or the Colts as one of the 10 best teams in football. Right. And I think both of those teams, like, I think the Titans got worse because they lose AJ Brown. They don't have any significant upgrades. Robert Woods helps a little bit. And the Colts, I think everyone is expecting that Matt Ryan is going to be a big upgrade on Carson Wentz. I'm not so sure about that. I think that Carson Wentz was totally fine. It's just he had a really bad end to last season. And then the other thing is, is the Colts, they led the league in turnover differential, a plus 14, tied with the Cowboys. So that, is very, there. that is very noisy year to year. And so the Jags, even though I'm not super excited about the team in general, I do think they have upside because they had the worst coaching situation in the league with Urban Meyer. Now you go to Doug Peterson. You're not just going from the worst situation to competence. You're going to an above average coach. Doug Peterson won the Super Bowl with Nick Foles. He is a good coach. So there's yep. upside there. But really, this is a bet on Trevor Lawrence. Because Trevor Lawrence came into the NFL as the most touted college quarterback since Andrew Luck. Right. That pedigree doesn't disappear after one bad season, particularly with the urban context. So yeah. I think Trevor Lawrence has a huge amount of upside. Wouldn't be surprised at all if he's the best quarterback in the division this year. He has that ceiling. So I'm taking the Jags at plus 700. Plus 700 means that if you think it's a 13% chance or better, then it's a good bet. And I do. Uh, according to our friend Warren Sharp, Jacksonville is the 12th easiest strength of schedule. So yep. they should get off to a hot run here. And by the way, like I like them, but at this point, can't we say sort of the I think the jury's still out on whether Frank Reich is a good coach. Wasn't a good I, end I, to the season. Right. Well, that's what, I mean, like, they they couldn't beat the Jaguars last year. Like, or I mean, the like, Raiders. Right. I mean, like, they lost some bad games. And yep. so, I think, you know, I think we're all in on Frank Reich as an offensive coordinator. But yep. I think the jury is still out as to whether or not he is a, you know, an above average head coach. And mm. so, we'll see. Uh, to your point about Carson Wentz, some bone – Obviously, some high-profile bad mistakes, yep. but he was 27 and seven last year. Touchdown interceptions. Like yep. he had a statistically very good year. They had your point. They got really lucky on defense. You know, with the turnover differential. So I don't mind that bet at all. I think that's I think that's really interesting. Would be a great story if yep. the Jaguars if could uh, could uh, could overcome Urban Meyer, yep. who just to be clear, and I speak for myself here and only myself. Don't I want to, uh, but but I don't believe. Urban Meyer is welcome at a Jaguars. We've seen what he's done in, in bar and restaurant-like establishments, and we would prefer Applebee's is family-friendly. That's all yeah. I'm going to say. Again, that is me not speak. I'm not speaking for Applebee's. Yeah. But That's just Matthew my Barrett. own personal opinion, as somebody who now apparently represents Applebee's <laughs> for the second straight day, Urban Meyer would prefer you to take your business elsewhere. There we go. Look, last thing. Because Ur Urban Meyer watches every second of the show. I know he does. That. He devours it. Last thing, if you're looking for a team to be yeah. this year's Bengals. Like, I don't think the Jags are going to the Super Bowl. But if you're just looking for a team that fits that archetype, second year for a number one pick quarterback, Trevor Lawrence has a bit of Joe Burrow about him in that sense. And look, they've got Christian Kirk. They've got weapons. Defense has pieces. I think they, they have improved the offensive line. Yeah. Nine wins might win the division. It's a, it's a, I, like, I like the call. I like the call, especially um, at they're what, plus 700? Plus 700. Plus 700. Get better than that. All right, next one. You already teased it. Rashawn Gary to win Defensive Player of the Year at plus 3,000. Yeah, so Rashawn Gary is a superstar. It's right. just people I don't think realize it yet because he only had nine and a half sacks. Last year, he didn't get the big, juicy numbers, but he was fifth in the league in total pressures. He just wasn't converting the pressures into sacks. If he just converts them at an average rate, he has 16 sacks last year, and we're talking about him in the same breath as guys like Nick Bosa, who have much shorter odds. So I think that Gary, he clearly has the talent. He's the leader of this defense now. 
And I think the defense has upside to be really good with Jair Alexander back for a full season. It might be more of a defensive team as well with the questions on offense. The offense will be fine. Aaron Rodgers is still there, but I wouldn't be shocked if the Packers defense ranks higher than the Packers offense. And the main thing here too is that Look, the Packers are favored in 15 of their 17 games this year, which means teams are going to be throwing on them, which means there are going to be pass rush opportunities for Rashawn Gary. I think that he can, he can get big sack numbers, and this has become a sack leader award. We saw TJ Watt breaks, ties the sack record, just wins the award by default. So I think that Rashawn Gary can put up big numbers. He'll get attention. He's going to be in prime time a lot as well, which matters because these awards are about narrative. So I think that a plus 3,000, uh, there's some value there. Aaron Donald won this award uh, two straight years, 2017, 2018. He averaged 16 sacks a season, to yep. your point. And I think, look, we always say these awards are for, for teams that win and everything like that, players on teams that win. To your point, that's going to be one of the narratives around the Packers is that if they overcome the loss of Devontae Adams yep. uh, and Aaron Rodgers, you know, after all the offseason drama, came back to Green Bay and they win another division title, they go far in the playoffs, maybe they make the Super Bowl, and they have the strong defense, because I agree with you. I think it's going to be a very good defensive team. I've said this before. My favorite bet, bet is the over on 10.5 wins yep. for the Packers. Your point, they're favored in 15 to 17 games. Like, yep. they've hit that number three straight years. Like, I I'm sorry, Devontae Adams is good, but he's not that good. No. He's not, you know, he's not like three losses good. Um, so give me, uh, I like this, I like this bet as well. Uh, again, I think that if they do well and the defense will be a narrative as to why they do well and Rashawn Gary's the leader of that defense, I can see that. Uh, so let's move on now. Our, uh, your next best bet is who's winning the rushing title. So look, and this goes back to what we were talking about value. I don't think this guy is going to win the rushing title in terms of a 50% chance or better, but Saquon Barkley is plus 5,000, 50 to one to win the rushing title. And look, with a guy like Saquon, he has a huge range of outcomes of what he could be this year. Sure. He might just be done. He might be right. completely done. The injuries might've played, taken their toll, but at the same time, he might be a generational talent who went two in the draft, who is now finally healthy played in the preseason for the first time since his rookie year. He clearly has the talent. And with someone like that, I don't want to bet over under 900 and a half rushing yards at minus 110. Like, give me it all. Give me the home right. run swing because he's got that in him. So plus 5,000 to win the rushing title. He had 1,307 rushing yards as a rookie. That would have been second in the NFL last season. It's a lower bar to clear. So I think that Saquon... You know, the rushing title that goes to three down workhorse backs uh, who don't have elite quarterbacks, who aren't going to throw too much. And you just go down the list, like who can actually get that workload in that context and win a rushing title? Like Jonathan Taylor? Yes. Derrick Henry? Yes. But then you go further down, like Najee Harris, is he going to have the efficiency? Uh, other guys like Javante Williams is going to be in a timeshare to start. Uh, Elijah Mitchell, there's just too many people in San Francisco. Yeah, yeah. So I think that Saquon, he has the upside to actually win the rushing title, and there's not many players who do. Yeah, I like that call, especially, by the way, you may think about Brian Dayball, and he's like, look, I got two options. I can either hand the ball off to Saquon Barkley, or no. I can let Daniel Jones do something with it. And he yeah. may just be like, you know what? Sorry, Saquon, you're getting 20 touches a game. Like, yeah. you know, it, and so the volume may absolutely be there. And by the way, if Dayball gets uh, Daniel Jones on the move, Mm. tries to get him outside the pocket and try to use some of the mobility the way he did with Josh Allen and Buffalo, then you could see that opening up some running lanes for Saquon Barkley. One of the issues with Barkley the last two years is he hasn't been healthy and he has, we haven't seen those big explosive plays. Exactly. We haven't seen those 75-yard runs that we mm. saw his rookie year. And so maybe now, a couple of years removed from the ACL, does he get that explosiveness back? And so we don't know, right? Your point, wide range of outcomes for him. But certainly uh, at plus 5,000, Five percent chance, right? Not bad. Pretty good. Pretty good odds. Like I like that call. And look, I think Saquon's a really interesting fantasy play as well. Definitely. In terms of, again, we can't. We, like, if you ain't first, you're last. Like, yep. why not there in the middle of the second rounds? I certainly like him more than Brees Hall, who's going, you know, going around that area. You know, some of the other guys that are going around uh, Saquon Barkley. He's moving up, right? He's. I'm now. I'm looking at uh, ADP. He's actually. He's finally moving up here. But, like, I like Saquon more than, like, Nick Chubb. Definitely. You know, is, yep. who's going ahead of him in terms of upside. All right. Super, you said you were going to end this segment with who you have to win the Super Bowl or your best bet to win the Super Bowl in terms of both potential to actually do it and the best odds that you can get to do it. The favorites, as we mentioned, Buccaneers, uh, Chiefs, as you see there. Bucks are plus 900. Bills just plus 650. 
but I feel like you're going lower on that list. Going to the bottom of the list, the Los Angeles Chargers at plus 1,300. I talked about this yesterday. This is a bet on Justin Herbert, who in terms of what goes into the betting lines, yep. we rank Justin Herbert as the best quarterback in the NFL. And he's got so much talent around him now. The offensive line, I mean, how gutted would you be if you're Phil Rivers? Because his right. entire career, he didn't have an offensive line. Correct. And now this young, good-looking guy, Justin Herbert, has the offensive right. line, has a lot of weapons. Uh, in terms of receiving threats, Austin Eckler out of the backfield. On offense, they're loaded. They were already a really good offense. Yeah. And then the weakness of the team was rushing defense, which if you want to have one weakness, that's it. Because if you have a bad passing defense, then you're done. Right. But they had a bad rushing defense, and they've fixed that to a degree. They bring in Khalil Mack, who is an edge rusher, but also an elite rushing defensive player as an edge rusher. You also bring in Sebastian Joseph Day, more heft on the interior. JC Jackson, who might be a top five cornerback in the league. Yeah. I'm also all in on the Brandon Staley experience as you know, someone who, who crunches the numbers, numbers and everything. Analytics, love, right? Love, love it. Right, yeah, yeah. He literally just won them a game last season against Cleveland early on in the season. If you have any other coach, no one else is going for it on fourth and eight in their own territory. He yeah. won them that game by himself. He had some plays go against him as well at the end yeah, of the yeah, season, yeah. but at the same time, he is optimizing but you keep, if their you chance. Keep playing, you keep playing the odds, eventually it starts falling in your favor, and that's he's, what Staley's going to do. He's flipping a loaded coin every time he does it, and it's weighted in his favor. So I like the charges. Like I said, I think the, the, the safe choice is Bucks v. Bills, but in terms of the odds, in terms of my heart, give me charges v. Niners, charges win, Trey Lance misses Michael Crabtree in the end zone on fourth down. Yeah, well they, I, li I like it. By the way, Chargers opened as plus 2200 to win the Super Bowl back in January. So already the, the betting markets are yeah. the sharps love them. The sharps absolutely love them. Sophia loves you. We can only we can only hope. There we go. We'll be back after this. Me, you, maybe Sophia. We don't know. <laughs> I'm gonna keep you updated. Over the weekend, I, and I alone, tweeted this out. This week on the Fantasy Football Happy Hour, available wherever you get your podcasts. Please like and subscribe. And I mean that, by the way. Please like and subscribe our podcast here at the Fantasy Football Happy Hour. We are doing an AMA, Ask Matthew Anything. So what do you want to know? Football nonsense, leave your question below, and we may use it on the podcast and on Peacock TV. So we got a bunch of responses. Now, again, at, uh, at, uh, at NBC Sports, they didn't tweet it out. At SNF on uh, uh, on uh, NBC didn't tweet it out. At you know at NBC Sports Edge FB didn't tweet it out. Me me alone. I had, to, I had to carry off. the load. Social yeah. media team was off on the weekend. It was just me. Hey Matthew, we need you to do our jobs for us. So it's fine. I did. I did because I'm a team player. I'm a company man. You're a team player. So what came, what came through? I haven't looked at these questions. Yeah. I don't look at my mentions. So forgive me if I butcher any of these handles, which I surely will. But the first one is an easy one. At Whit Baldwin says, who was your first fantasy football draft pick ever? Mine was Sean Alexander. Okay. And by the, that was Wit's first one. That was Wit's. Right, mine not yours. was Steven Jackson, I think. Okay. I think he let me down. Not enough touchdowns on those uh, Rams teams. Uh, uh, they kept going on. two and four teams. Well, that's Jeff Fisher's fault, not, yeah, not Steven exactly. Jackson. No, he um, did the right thing. Uh, we love Steven Jackson here on the show. One of my favorite players ever, Steven mm. Jackson, by the way, uh, just randomly. So, again, this is one of those, like, this is a sneaky question because you know what it is? Mm. This is like, hey, Barry, show how old age. are you? Yeah, show your that's age. exactly right. <laughs> That's exactly right. This is a, I'm going to ask him how old he is yeah. without asking him how old he is. It's you know, it's like it's clever from at Whit Baldwin. It really yeah. is. It's one of those like you know, like on sometimes like on TikTok or Instagram, like you know, tell me you're a blank without mm. telling me you're blank. That's what it's. Tell me yep. you're an old <laughs> f, you know, without telling me you're an old f. So um, that's what I am. Uh, <laughs> uh, my very first time ever playing fantasy football. Mm. I started playing fantasy baseball in 1984 when I was 14 years old. Mm. Uh, when I was in 1994, my second year in college was when I started playing fantasy football. My first pick that year was Marshall Falk, which wow. worked out pretty well. That's a pretty good one. Yeah, pretty good one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> worked out really well. My Not first baseball pick ever, by the way, my first fantasy baseball pick back in 1984 was Mario Soto. Okay. The, the former Reds pitcher. But my second one was Tony Gwynn. Okay, it was, that it was out uh, yeah, it was a uh, yeah. So that one worked out. Tony Gwynn worked out pretty well. Um, it, but back in 1984, no one had any strategy or anything like that. I was, I was like, oh, Mario Soto should be a good pitcher. Like, whatever. <laughs> I was doing an auction draft, and so Soto came up in his. Marshall cheaper. Falk. That's Marshall a good one. Marshall Falk. That, okay. Yes. Next one from at Jung Elon Musk. Right. Is Travis Etienne 
a viable running back too. Right. By the way, as far as we know here on the Fantasy Football Happy Hour, not actually related to Elon Musk. That's our best guess. Yeah. That is our best guess. We cannot, we can neither confirm nor de uh, uh, deny. Um, yes. I mean, look, I have ETN ranked 18th, so obviously I think he can be a top 24 running back. I don't think the, the challenge for him to get there is that high. No. I, I, again, I mean, we sort of talk about that running back dead zone and some of the guys that are going around him. But my expectation here is that even if James Robinson gets into the mix here, uh, we think that ETN, we think he's a special player. Yep. We think reconnected, obviously, with Trevor Lawrence, his college quarterback, should be good. Think about this. Last year, James Robinson, on a disaster of a team, everything that could have gone wrong for the Jaguars last year went wrong. And James Robinson yet still was the eighth best running back in fantasy from weeks one through six. I, so... The Jaguars have actually, thanks to James Robinson, been able to produce fantasy-relevant running backs. We expect this under Doug Peterson to be a much more uh, fantasy-friendly offense and a much more pass-happy offense. And obviously, ETN is going to be the passing down back. And I, I believe that uh, when you think about sort of how he plays, those kind of big play, that big playability of ETN, I think that, uh, to me, I don't think he has to do much to return a profit. He's going at running back 22 and 44th overall on Yahoo. Again, I'm at 18 at 37. So... I truly believe he can be a top 20 running back this year, an RB2, a viable RB2, and obviously Yahoo drafters do as well. So Yeah, I look. think the, th the thing with Etienne and the Jags in general is that it's going to be a committee. That's how Doug Peterson does it. No Correct. eagle got more than 180 carries under Doug Peterson. Correct. It was a mismatch, a lot of Ryan Matthews, Corey Clement, LeGarrette Blunt. My Jay namesake. Jay Ajayi. My namesake, Jay Ajayi. Yeah. Uh, so I think that Etienne... He doesn't have the immense upside because of that committee. He's not going to be a Jonathan Taylor. He doesn't have that in him. Correct. But you're not expecting that when you're drafting him. And he seems totally fine to me as an RB2. Yeah, I mean, look, again, assuming you play in a league where that's, it's PPR, at least half PPR, mm. his pass catching and his yards after the catch ability and the fact that he's going to be so involved in so many different dynamic plays, I think is really interesting to me. So I, I just think there's, there's upside in the player. I agree with you. I, I don't think he's got a shot at getting an RB1 unless something really freaky happens, yep. but I do think he's got a higher floor based on the pass catching than some of the other guys going around him. Yeah, okay. So the next one is from at the sincere K-Bane. Okay. And this one... I like that he uses sincere. <laughs> like, just so, just so we know, this is this is a genuine question. All right, yeah, yeah. what do we got? So this one is for Jay to see how well he knows his new co-host at Matthew Berry TMR. Okay, Jay, good. do you think Matthew was born before or after... World War One, not even wow. not even World War Two, World yeah. War One. What is this guy's name? <laughs> At the sincere K Bane. Yeah, all right. I mean that's silly. I mean the question would be World War Two. Can we two? Take, a, take? Can we take a single of me here on one here for one question? <laughs> hey, just see. I don't know if you can read between the lines here, but um, <laughs> that's, that's what I'm. That's a tough one. I, that's a just so you know. Yeah. Uh, if, world War One. Come on. Come on. Not that old. I'm no. old, but I'm not that old. No. World War II so would I'm have been the question. That would be, so that ended in 1945. So it's over under 77 and a half years. Um, yeah. So, you guys are cruel. Yeah. You guys are cruel. That's is cruel. what you are. Okay. Very cruel. At Sean Mansfield 15, yeah. how boom or bust is CD Lamb this year? Can he truly get to 1,400 yards and eight touchdowns? I believe he can. I, look, I, I, don't, I don't think there's any chance he busts barring an injury. Yeah. I, he's That's going cool. to get a massive target share. I mean, think about... Amari Cooper and Cedric Wilson leaving for a free agency. There is now a 28% target share from last year on the Cowboys that are now available. And so you think about, okay, what's his competition for targets? Dalton Schultz is still there. I mean, we're talking about Michael Gallup, who's coming back from a very serious injury. You've got Jalen Tolbert there, like Noah Brown. Like, it's, they, by, by releasing Amari Cooper, they basically, Jerry Jones and that team basically said, like, hey, CeeDee Lamb, you are the guy. Hmm. So I, my expectation here is that he just gets a massive, massive target share. This is a guy in his first two years in the league got over 100 targets, right? 104 last year. Um, and so CeeDee Lamb, who's been a borderline top 20 wide receiver each of the first two years with all those other targets around there, he's, he, he, he gets into the number one role. And I also think about this offense and CeeDee Lamb's versatility. He can play inside. He can play outside. They're going to be able to move him all over the line of scrimmage to create mismatches. I, I don't think there's any bust in him, barring an injury. No, to me, he, he can boom. Very yeah. high floor. And a number one wide receiver in fantasy is within the range of outcomes for CeeDee Lamb. 
Yeah, the one concern would be that this Dallas offense, they haven't really given an individual receiver huge target share before to right. see how it operates. At the same time, there's probably not been the gap that there is between C.D. Lamb and the second best receiver on the team, who right now is Jalen Tolbert, potentially. Right. So there could be some change there. I mean, his, his totals for the season are set at 1175.5 yards, seven and a half touchdowns. So that's what we're, we're expecting is the average. Give so, me the over. Yeah, so I'm that's taking a, the over on both of them. And that's a very high floor as well right. there's not many guys who are set at that level so yeah i think there's a lot of boom with cd and there's no real bust unless he gets hurt uh next question at trader tennessee matthew if you could be any fruit out besides a berry ah. what would you be if i could be any fruit it's a great question from at trader tennessee really because i think it's a terrible question <laughs> if i could be any fruit besides a berry what fruit would i be yeah. um i mean um, I, that's a good question. Like, uh, I mean, do do Choco Tacos count they as count. a fruit? They absolutely count. <laughs> they do not count as a fruit. I mean, I would probably be. Uh, I mean, I'm just trying to think of my own. Um, you know, listen. I think I would. Well, you know what? I'd be an orange. I'd be an orange. Be I, went an orange. To, I went to Syracuse. Okay. Go like or, or look. Everyone loves oranges. Right? I mean, I went to Syracuse, so obviously go orange. But, I mean, listen, you're handed out at halftime of kids' soccer games, you yep. know. You come in a nice, you know, protective seal. Mm. Um, uh, you know, you can you peel off. You know, you can be shared among people as well, like the little, little slices as well. Mm. You can be squeezed and made into a delicious juice. A lot of versatility to an orange. Give me an orange. I'm yeah. going to be an orange. That was a lot tougher question than the CD Lamb boom or bus question. It really wasn't was. It? Yeah. Okay, next one. At King Jar 121. Okay. Do you think Which, he's really a king? Do you think he's actually royalty? Or do you think he just made I'd that say up? it's uh, plus 15,000. He's actually <laughs> right, a king. king right. Okay. Which receiver with an ADP between rounds five and six do you believe has the best chance to finish top five at the position? I got three. Okay. And I'm going to give you three and then you tell me which ones you like. Yeah. So I, I, I have the, I pulled it up right here. I've got the, I've got the Yahoo ADP uh, in terms of rounds five and six. And here's who's going on Yahoo between rounds five and six that qualify at the position of wide receiver. Terry McLaurin, or Terry McScorn as I like to call him, Mike Williams, Jalen Waddell, Cortland Sutton, Deontay Johnson, Allen Robinson, DK Metcalf. And I will say there are three that jump out to me that have a chance at being top five. And of course they all do, hmm. right? But I'm gonna say Terry McLaurin. I'm gonna That's say, of course, well, massive tar he's gonna get a massive target share he has every year of his career and he's playing with the best quarterback of his career, not particularly close. Hmm. I'm gonna say Mike Williams. Like, we've talked about on this show before, and I know we're going to talk about elsewhere, like uh, we talked about earlier, right? Um, Justin Herbert, you know, and just in what we expect that offense to be. We expect Justin Herbert to have a, a you know, a massive, massive ceiling. We talked about him on yesterday's show as well, right? So I think if you're just like, could Mike Williams put it all together this year? You know, I'm already, I'm betting on sort of the, that Keenan Allen takes a step back this year. Mike Williams takes a step up. So I think Mike Williams, especially if the touchdowns get there. And then I'll say Allen Robinson. Your guy. Who's my guy, who's, by the way, been a board. I don't know that he's ever been a top five, but he's absolutely been a top 10 fantasy wide receiver. QB adjusted, that he has been. There, exactly. No. I, again, we saw what uh, adding Matthew Stafford to Cooper Cup last year did for Cooper Cup. And so if defense is focused this year on, hey, we're taking away Cooper Cup, I, my expectation is, is that Allen Robinson with some touchdown luck could get there as well. Definitely. Yeah, I think you mentioned two of the guys that I had. And when you're talking about someone who's going fifth or sixth round and the upside to become a top five at the position, you want variance. You want huge ceiling. And what creates variance is the unknown. And the unknown is a new quarterback situation. Right. Carson Wentz for Terry McLaurin and Matthew Stafford for Allen Robinson. So they definitely have that upside yeah. just because we haven't seen it before. A lot of the other guys we have. So I'd like those two. Okay. At Montana Sauce. Now, would you, would you have put under that same scenario, Cortland Sutton also has a new quarterback. Would you, put him, would you have put him in that list? I would. I just don't think he's quite as talented as Terry McLaurin and Allen Robinson. I don't think he's would far agree. off. But I believe that those two guys have more upside. They've just I, shown more. And I also think Russell Wilson, you know, with any indication of what he's done in his career, he likes to spread the ball around. Yeah. You know, Russell's a big, you know, uh, team guy. They're going to run the ball as well. Yeah. A lot. But by the way, actually, other than Jalen Waddle, they all have new quarterbacks. DK Metcalf now has Geno Smith. Well, yeah. Um, right? <laughs> Deontay Stafford. Johnson now has Mitch Trubisky and maybe, um, uh, you know, maybe Kenny Pickett at some point. So they all do, you know. There's upside there. Okay. Sure. At, but anyway, okay. What else? What's at next? At Montana Sauce. Okay. Uh, do you have any 
other cool or funny George Carlin stories that you could tell us? I have a lot of funny and cool George Carlin stories. I don't know if I can tell it on the air. Um, let's see. Let's be careful after the Alvin Kamara exploited by Yeah, Moore. I mean, can I tell? I'm trying to think if I can tell this story on air. I probably, <laughs> I probably can't. Um, here's what. Oh, I'll, I'll, here's a version of, of this. Uh, here's a story I can tell you. Mm. So George Carlin is famous for the seven dirty words on television routine. Yep. And it's actually, I remember talking to him about it, and when I worked for him, I was working for him on the George Carlin show, which was a sitcom on Fox, and so I was the stage assistant. So in essence, I was George's assistant for the year. And we did an episode of that show where, uh, that was a play off the seven dirty words, that George was a cab driver in the show, and he gets, he, uh, he, gets, he, he starts cursing in the cab, and somebody calls him, and he, gets, he has to go to court for his taxi license, whatever. Whatever. All it was, it was a basic, it was a loose premise to get to the seven dirty words you can't say on television. So seven dirty words you couldn't say in a cab. And, um, and so it's a famous routine. I remember saying to George, I studied you in college. Mm. It's like, what are you talking about? Like, I went to Syracuse University. I, I took a class called Com Law. Mm. Shout out to Professor Flocky, wherever <laughs> she is. And I took, a I took a course called Com Law. And I said, so we studied these, you know, famous, uh, you know, uh, court cases that involved communications in some way. And one of them was... I believe it was WBAI versus the FCC. And that was a radio station on Long Island that played the seven dirty words routine. Mm. And so I studied that, and so I mentioned that to, to George. And George says, you know, it's fascinating, right? He goes, um, uh, he goes I, that routine is in, is in the law books as mm. what is the definition of profanity. Yeah, right. What is the definition of profanity? <laughs> and um, he goes, and what's amazing is, is that that routine is like I had like, I had to come up with a new 10 minutes. Mm. He goes, and so, you know, that night I'm like, I'm drunk out of my mind. And I'm just trying to come up with, and I was just like, ah, oh, nine words, six words, seven, seven dirty words. That sounds funny. That sounds funny. He goes, and then I'm going through the dirty words. And don't worry, Alex, I'm not going to say them. <laughs> but like, he's just like, I'm going through like this word, this word, this word. Oh, this is a funnier sounding word. Mm. Like, you know, okay, what, what means this, this or this or this, you know? And it's just like, oh, that's the... And he's just like, I, he's like, I literally made it up in like 10 minutes, like drunk out of my mind. Mm. Like, and all I did was, was trying to come up with the funniest sounding dirty words. Yeah. And he goes, and that's the definition of profanity in America today. <laughs> Something that I came up with drunk out of my mind at like 3 a.m. <laughs> and so uh, anyway, that was George. And if you've ever watched any of George's routines, and I highly recommend going to YouTube and watching like a bunch of his routines because he was brilliant. Some of our younger viewers may not be aware of it. He was truly a, truly a brilliant man. And language was always a big thing for him. Like, and he would always say... Like, language isn't important. It's the intent behind the language that means everything. He's like, because you can make anything sound inappropriate or not, you know, it's all about the intent. Yep. He's like, you know, ask me what I did this weekend. What did you do this weekend? Well, uh, me and my wife, I uh, took the dog <laughs> out for a walk. <laughs> it's good. That's what we did. Yeah. Took the dog out for a walk. What is this? In the morning it's an actor. and the evening. Mm. That's what we did. Mm. Again, like, I mean, like, so that seems like there's another meaning to it, but I'm just telling you, that's all my wife and I did. We, we took the dog out for a walk. So I, like, so that was George's whole thing was just about, it's all about intent and not about the language. And so George was brilliant about language. He's brilliant. And I loved working for the man. Whatever. I, this is the other thing I will say is that George was a brilliantly, uh, brilliant comedian, but also like an incredibly kind boss, unbelievable man, and loved working for him and the complete opposite of how he was on stage. Like he was the, the sweetest, most gentle guy. Mm. Like if you didn't, and then you'd see him on stage, and it's like it, you know he's this crazy, ranting, angry guy. But off air, he was like the sweetest, most gentle. You know, I I loved the man. So there anyway, you go. rest producer, in peace. The, the, there you go. Our producer Alex was on the edge of her seat. That I'm entire sure. Entire segment, but we got through I will, it. Alex, I will tell you that story off air because it's <laughs> it's funnier with the curse words. I will just tell you that it's definitely funnier with the curse words. Okay, at Masshead99. Is drafting Gabe Davis at pick 37 before guys like Deontay Johnson, Mike Williams, Cortland Sutton, and Marquise Brown so outrageous? Um, it's not outrageous. I, I'm a big believer in, hey, get your guys, yep. right? And I'm a big believer in get your guys. Uh, so, and get your guys when you want to. Having said that, I mean, you, you know, by taking him there, you're basically taking out all profit. You're taking, I mean, like taking them that high, right? You know, before guys like 
Johnson, Sutton, Marquise Brown, guys that have produced at a high level for. I mean, I know it's been a while for Sutton, but we've seen him produce. We expect better things, obviously, with Russell Wilson under center. You know, Deontay Johnson has been nothing short of terrific, and mm. we think he's got a quarterback upgrade this year. Hollywood Brown reconnected with his college quarterback. We expect him to have a big year in Arizona as well. So you're basically drafting him at, at you know, his, his peak. Like, mm. the, like, there's not a lot of room for profit on Gabe Davis at that ADP. You're buying upside that hasn't happened yet. That's correct. Yeah. yeah, so I don't think it's outrageous because I'm, big, I'm, a, I'm a big believer in the player, and I think he has a monster year. I'm all in on Gabe Davis. I love him. I have him on every dynasty team what one, and I'm annoyed at the one guy that won't <laughs> trade me Gabe Davis in that one dynasty league. I've tried a million times, but, uh, but yeah, you're, you're buying him at a high profit. So it's not outrageous. Just understand what you're getting yourself into. You don't have a lot of, a lot of room for profit. You do have room for downside if, you know, the touchdowns don't end up going his way. Yep. No, I agree with that. And the last one. You know what? I'm just annoyed, too. I just realized. Because mm. we're, anyway, well, I'll, I'll tell you off the air. I just, <laughs> anyway, sorry. Go ahead. What else? Okay, have? the last one. I've got no chance of pronouncing this handle. So it's at Shiloh's GMA. How much emphasis do you place on preseason games, if any? Some. I think it, it's all situationally dependent. Like, so on one hand, like, you don't want to be sucked in by, you know, players having monster games against uh, you know vanilla, vanilla defenses backups that kind of thing so I, I tend not to get sucked in by performance what I do get sucked in is by usage that's what's important right and so the idea of like so Damian Pierce is somebody who skyrocketed up ADP this yep. year because of he's had really strong performance but what's important to me is usage like they held him out of the second preseason game normally like a fourth round rookie doesn't get held out of the second preseason game yep. but that made you think oh He's their starter. Mm. And it's clear that, you know, he's, we think he's the best guy on that team. So seeing how many snaps a player plays with the first team offense, seeing how many snaps, how many routes somebody runs with the first team quarterback. Like, like um, uh, Mo Alley Cox, who I'm obsessed with Mo Alley, <laughs> Mo Alley Cox. Mac. But like, honestly, Mo Alley Cox has been playing a ton of snaps with Matt Ryan in the first team offense. And he's been running a route on over half of half of the snaps that Matt Ryan's been under center. And you're like, okay, that's interesting. Hmm. So I, I think over 70%, uh, if I have that correct, shout out to Dwayne McFarlane, uh, who, who, uh, who charts that. A and so, I, I don't know, like that's what I'm looking for in the preseason game is usage in terms of are they playing with the first team? How many snaps are they getting? What's the rotation? You know, how many routes are they running with the first team quarterback underneath, under center? Are they being held out with the rest of the starters? That kind of thing. So that's what is, um, I think, interesting in the preseason. Having said that, it's still the preseason. It's the preseason for a reason. Mm. The Ravens have never lost a preseason game in history, as far as I can tell. They have lost regular NFL games. It's the preseason. Do so, you think Logan Thomas is jealous of all this Mo Ali Cox chat? He's not. He's Logan not. knows. Logan knows <laughs> he where, knows where it's one. at. Okay. He knows where it's number one. But I, I do have a weird obsession with Mo Ali Cox. <laughs> You know, make Mo Alley Cox a thing, America. That's all I'm asking. Appreciate you guys. Can you name the seven dirty words? Let's do it off the break. We're on tape. We could actually do it right now. <laughs>
I think when my rankings update is, I need to move him up a little bit. He's he's right now. I'm at running back 24, 69th overall, and yet I'm probably a little bit too low on him. But Yahoo ranker, Yahoo drafters is even lower. They am at running back 28, 77th overall. Mm-hmm. Uh, the previous segment, we just we were asked a question: What do you watch for in the preseason? Right. Well, we work for usage. Okay. Devin Singletary started and played every single snap with the starters in the in the preseason game against the Broncos, right? Four times, 39 yards, 31 after contact. Did not play in the first two preseason games, weeks one and three, okay? I mean, like, they're holding out their starters. Seems like week two was when uh, they wanted to uh, tr- sort of trot out the offense there. Um, and he's good. Like, this was a guy who was really good down the stretch last year, Jay. He was, yeah, and I think – I think people are overthinking it a little bit because he's not a big name. He's not that sexy. No. You think of the Bills offense, you think Josh Allen, then you think Stephon Diggs, and then Gabriel Davis, who's been just about the most discussed fantasy player right. in the offseason. You don't think of Devin Singletary, but the Bills are the Super Bowl favorite. They have the highest win total in the league at 11 and a half with the overjuice. So he has the potential to be a three down back with not that much competition on the Super Bowl favorite. I mean, his. His totals that we have him set out are 749 and a half rushing yards, five and a half touchdowns. I think that's his floor. He can definitely go over that. And if he does go over that, then he's going to vastly outperform his ADP. Six touchdowns in his final four games here, you know, over over 100 total yards in uh, uh, three of the last four games as well. I think people are like, oh, what about Zach Moss? What about James Cook? Like, mm. Zach Moss was a healthy scratch yeah. at times last year. Yeah. And, and, and James Cook, we, we think he's a nice player, but he's a pass catcher. He's basically filling the role that they tried to fill with J.D. McKissick when they signed him uh, in the offseason and then Washington ended up getting him back. And so he's going to be a pass catching role. But Singletary's a nice pass catcher as well. And so I think down the stretch last year, Devin Singletary proved he could be an every down back. And mm. so we're talking about a guy that's going to get, let's call it 70% of the running back snaps That's for the work. best offense in football. Yeah. Or, you know, I mean, again, we're in this running back, running back dead zone. I think people, he was running back 18 mm. last year. He was, he was running back 18 overall. He was 26th in points per game. We think he's probably in a better situation this year than he was last year. Again, I think he's sort of proven that he's, he's better than Zach Moss. We expect that offense to be better. Like, James I think Cook. we're too low. I think we're too low on Devin Singletary. Yeah, James Cook as well. He's a rookie running back on the Super Bowl favorite. He's not just going to assume Devin Singletary's role. So I think that role is pretty secure. Another running back question for the yes, Patriots. Sir. Does Damian Harris going ahead of Ramondre Stevenson in Yahoo ADP surprise you? Yes. Mm. Yes. You're a big Ramondre guy. I love Ramondre. I'm Team Ramondre. Hashtag Team Ramondre. It doesn't surprise me in this sense. Damian Harris is the bigger name. He's the he's the quote unquote starter. Last year, when both guys were healthy, Harris was sort of the guy. Mm. But it surprises me just in the fact that like we've been Team Ramondre for a while now. Mm. We've been on the air for over a week. How how long do we got to be <laughs> ringing this bell before Yahoo drafters are paying attention? Is not everyone in the sh- world <laughs> watching our show? Look, I think Damian Harris doesn't everyone have Peacock? <laughs> What's going on? We thought like. Doesn't everyone pay attention to and follow every single thing I do? They Is that, should. They should. Mm. I mean, except in my own household. <laughs> I if think I told my daughters to draft for Andre Stevens over Damien Harris, they, they would literally draft Damien Harris yeah. purposely. They look Here's Harris's what they would do. Touchdowns. Here's what they would do. You know what they would do? Is they, they, would, they would get up their phone and they'd go, oh, you want me to draft for Andre Stevens over Damien Harris? You know what I'm doing? Drafting <laughs> Damien Harris. They would get, they'd get their little beady eyes right in my face and do it because – I have rebellious daughters. My wife would do the same thing. I have no power in my own household. I like um, it. But look, Ramondre Stevenson last year, when he gets work, when Ramondre Stevenson gets work, legit. Last year, week 10 against Cleveland, uh, 24 touches, 114 total yards, finishes the second best running back in fantasy that week, right? You think about week two of the preseason here. He was in on the two minute drill with James White retiring. The expectation here is that he's going to inherit a lot of that role. Mm-hmm. I know there's talk about Montgomery, whatever. Like, I, 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 I believe there is a chance. Again, Belichick likes to use multiple running backs here. But I think there is a, a better than average chance that Ramondre Stevenson gets uh, half of the early down work and half of the goal line work and all the passing down work. And so the fact that he's going behind Damian Harris, who in the offseason there were rumors that the Patriots were willing to move on from Damian Harris, that they were looking for trade partners. And once James White retired, they're like, all right, we'll hang on to Harris. But 
I think Ramondre Stevenson is the future, and by the future, I mean this season for New England's running game. I think Ramondre now, he might even have a higher floor than Damian Harris because of all the stuff swirling around Harris, yeah. and he definitely has a higher ceiling because he is the future. And Belichick is talking about how they're both going to be three down backs and how they're going to alternate series. And I think if you're Team Ramondre, as we are, yeah. that's good news because yeah. it means he's got more chance to take over the role from Damian Harris. Okay, next one. Miami Dolphins. How much does Tyreek Hill's move from Patrick Mahomes to Tua Tagovailoa affect your ranking of him this season? Yeah, well, it definitely affects it. I mean, I understand, not, not in Tyreek's <laughs> mind. Because Tyreek is going to he, He's got Yeah, in Tyreek's mind, he's going to an upgrade. But Tyreek is wrong. Uh, yeah, I mean, look, I have him I have him at uh, wide receiver eight. I probably would have, still with Mahomes, he's probably wide receiver two or three. Yep. Right? I mean, like, he's right there with, uh, I think if he were still with Mahomes, I would have him ahead of Jamar Chase. So it'd probably be a cup Jefferson Hill for me there. Yep. So he moves down five spots. Super talented guy a guy that you can be creative with and get the ball in its hands a lot of different ways. And I think when you think about the contract and also you think about how Mike McDaniel used Debo Samuel last year in San Francisco, obviously Tyreek Hill and Debo Samuel built very differently as, as players. But the fact of the matter is, is that you, you saw last year how Mike McDaniel could use a wide receiver in a lot of creative ways and basically sort of manufacture touches for his most talented offensive player. My expectation is that he does that again in Miami with Tyreek Hill who I believe is their most talented offensive skill player. Uh, and so they will manufacture touches for Tyreek. He will get his. But do I think the offense is, is as explosive as it was in Kansas City? No. Do I think Tua Tungavailoa is as good as Patrick Mahomes? I sadly do not. No. Uh, so, yeah. So it, that's how it affects my rankings. I am down at eight. And I'll have to be honest with you. He makes me nervous. He's one of those guys that, like, that's where I rank him. But so far, I haven't got him on any drafts, and mm. I probably won't. No. Because I'm probably where he ends up going. I'm usually either on a running back or I've already gotten like a wide receiver one. And so I just haven't wound up with him on a lot of teams. That whole team makes me nervous because Tua with a new offensive line, what's he going to look like? New coach, new Tyreek Hill as a weapon. He was wide receiver six and wide receiver two in PPR the past two seasons. I think him going wide receiver nine or eight where you have him. I think that's about right. The one thing I would say about Tua is I think it's similar to the Carson Wentz thing where Carson Wentz, when he's bad, it's like James Harden's defense where it's, <laughs> yeah. it's comically bad. Comically and bad. Tua, social media teams love Tua Tagovailoa mm -hmm. because of when his passes sail, they sail into the crowd. It doesn't right. look like he's playing the same sport as other professional quarterbacks, but those are just random isolated plays. And in totality, I think he's going to be fine and he's throwing the ball deeper in preseason for whatever that means now the jets can yes. zach wilson support two fantasy viable wide receivers in elijah moore and garrett wilson yeah the question is do you believe in uh do you believe in zach wilson i know a lot of mothers do uh i know he's a, a fan favorite among moms uh the question is among fantasy managers that, that don't have young children and and the answer is is no i don't believe he can i don't believe he can i don't think that's fair to put on zach wilson um, I think the Jets' offense, as currently constructed, with a, with a young, inexperienced quarterback in Zach Wilson and an offensive line that's going through a transition with the, with the loss of Becton, I don't believe that offense can support two viable fantasy uh, wide receivers because I just don't think they're going to be high-flying enough, right? And by the way, they also, like, they have pass-catching running. Like, I do think you've got coaches that came from San Francisco, which is kind of a spread the ball around, right? And so, like, you still got Corey Davis there. You, you know, you got C.J. Uzoma in the, in the offseason. You've got nice pass-catching running backs in Brees Hall and Michael Carter. So, um, I think in terms of consistent fantasy value, obviously all those guys will have, you know, big games here and there. But for consistent fantasy values, give me Elijah Moore, who from weeks 9 through 13 last year was the second best wide receiver in terms of total fantasy points and points per game. He caught at least one touchdown in four of the five games. He finished fifth last year in receiving yards among rookie wide receivers, playing with a multitude of quarterbacks. It wasn't just Zach Wilson, but it was Joe Flacco. It was Mike White. Worth noting that, in fact, when Moore had his big run there, actually Wilson wasn't really out there. No. It, was, it was Mike White. It was Joe Flacco. I don't put a lot of stock into that. Again, um, you know, Zach Wilson is somebody that I believe uh, will be able to find uh, Elijah Moore um, and uh, get him the ball. And if he can't, look, it, they're going to start the season with Joe Flacco. I'm a big Elijah Moore believer, and 
it's weird. Garrett Wilson's going really late, mm. right? He's going 53rd for a quarterback. I, and I get it. You know, he's a wide receiver drafted in the top 10, but he went to the Jets and he mm. went to a, you know, a, a dysfunctional offense. But it's interesting, uh, you know, what, what's going to happen here with Wilson and Moore. I just think Moore is the more talented player. Loved Wilson coming out of college. I think dynasty prospects for him are high. But this year in redraft, there are other guys, I think, with more upside going late in drafts. Yeah, I would be very gravely concerned about the Jets receivers with Zach Wilson. In terms of what goes into the betting lines, we treat Zach Wilson, until proven otherwise, as basically the worst starting quarterback in the NFL. And look, he needs to start, and he's got upside, so he should play. But if he was out for the season we would have increased the Jets' win total because we think that, you know, they might have traded for Jimmy Garoppolo, Joe Flacco, Mike White on what they showed last year. They were playing better than Zach Wilson. So there's a lot of upside, but on what he's shown so far, I mean, no Jets receiver had more than 538 receiving yards last season. Yeah. I, I just, if he can stay healthy and mm -hmm. stay, you know, stay in the field, like we saw the potential last year. I just love Elijah, Elijah Moore's talent, and we saw it play out last year. He had fantasy production for, you know, a stretch of time there. One last question for you before we go to break here. So if you, if you, let's pretend, uh, here's my question for you. If you were a kid mm. and you walked home into your house <laughs> and you saw your mom there, your yeah, single I can mother, say where this is your going. single yeah. mother, your, yeah. your mom, and you want your mom to be happy, yeah. like for whatever reason, the dad's out of the picture. And so you want your mom to be happy and your mom is there with, I don't know, making it up here, Zach Wilson. <laughs> Yeah. And they're just like, they're in the coffee having kit. You know, have, you're in the kitchen uh, having coffee. Uh, just I hanging assume out that's in the morning. just exactly all that's happening. Right. So, yeah. right. It's, it's like it's early morning. It's whatever. You know, Zach's in like shorts and a t-shirt or something like that. Yeah. What's your reaction? <laughs> yeah, What's your well, reaction? I, I hope you didn't. You're like, you're like 16 years old. Yeah. I hope you it want mom to be happy. I hope it wasn't me and I hope he didn't hear that I said that he's the worst quarterback in the NFL. Right. Uh, well, I mean, I think I know what's going on there. And right. I feel. No, but I'm going to school with your reaction. Are you happy? Like, cool, it's Zach Wilson. Or you're like, oh my God. I don't think I'm that happy, to be honest, right. because there's just a lot swirling around. I think if it was any other quarterback in the NFL, okay I'd be okay. If it was Patrick Mahomes, then you're, phenomenal. You're, you're in. You're yeah. in. Zach Wilson, little little mess. So, so your your issue in this this completely alleged scenario <laughs> that we have no proof of is is not that Zach Wilson is hanging out with your mom, who's like whatever twenty something years older <laughs> yeah. than him. Yeah. It, it's that he's not as good as Patrick Mahomes. Exactly. Yeah. That is where Jay lands. All right, fair enough. Understood. I'd like to go through all the quarterbacks and rank them. Yeah. How, how where, where you would rank them in terms of if you walked in and saw your mom Let's with them. Let's do it. Segment four. Segment four coming up next on the Fantasy Football Happy Hour. There's not going to be a segment four. They're canceling <laughs> us now. You know that, right? It's all okay. Trying to figure out where to find all of my fantasy football analysis? Well, here you go. You can obviously watch the Fantasy Football Happy Hour on Peacock and on the NFL and NBC YouTube channel where clips and full episodes are available on demand. Obviously, you can listen 24-7 wherever you get your podcast. Please, not only download, but also like and subscribe. We can listen live to the show, NBC Sports Audio on Sirius XM Radio. Follow me on all forms of social media where I'm at Matthew Berry TMR, except the Fantasy Life app where I'm at Matthew Berry. I'm big on the TikTok these days. Follow me there. And of course, if you want my columns, my rankings, everything else, NBCSportsEdge.com for my written work. I'm now back with Jay Croucher finishing up uh, our, uh, our mailbag, our AMA, Ask Matthew Anything as we head into last call here. So, um, uh, Chet Stedman, 22. Chet wants to know, who do you have as touchdown leaders at each position? Quarterback, running back, tight end, wide receiver. Jay, why don't you take quarterback and running back? Give me Matthew Stafford. He's plus okay. 800 for the passing touchdown leader. They're not going to run the ball as much at the goal line. Now he's got two weapons in Cooper Cup and Allen Robinson. He's throwing a cup in triple coverage in the end zone. It's yeah. like 41 touchdowns last year. So give me Stafford there. And then for running back, give me James Conner. No, a guy yep. that you like. He's yep. plus 2,500 and the 14th favorite. I think Jonathan Taylor is the safest pick, but James Conner plus 2,500, 15 touchdowns last year. That offense, if you look at the last two years, they run when they get in close. We think it to be a pretty good offense. In terms of wide receiver, I'm going to say Justin Jefferson. If you watch me at all, you know I'm all in on the Vikings offense. Thielen's actually been the better touchdown scorer for Minnesota, but he's at plus 800. Cooper Cup's the favorite, but Jefferson is the second. Obviously, we're emerging 
Jefferson says, I want to be the best uh, t you know, wide receiver in football. That's, That's where it starts. Game. And a tight end, I'm taking Mark Andrews. Contract year for Lamar Jackson. A lot of targets available. 146 with Marquise Brown. Went to Arizona. Brown obviously gets a lot of red zone targets. He scored a lot last year. Andrews is my favorite there. All right, that is it for the show. We are back tomorrow. Listen, you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. For Jay Croucher, I am Matthew Berry. And on behalf of the entire Fantasy Football Happy Hour crew and Applebee's, hopefully they come back tomorrow, we will see you then. Peace out. Hey, it's Matthew Berry from NBC Sports and Rotoworld.com. Just want to thank you so much for watching what you just watched, or at least being too lazy to click out of it after the you know autoplay just kept it going. So either way, thank you so much for just letting it scroll by your screen. And now I'd like to ask you respectfully, 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 okay, respectfully, please subscribe to the NFL on NBC YouTube channel for the latest NFL news, fantasy headlines from Rotor World, and betting analysis from NBC Sports Edge.